Hey everybody, this is Jorge from the Big Bang Podcast. Um, I'm joined today by Adam Green, a senior editor with the Economics Intelligence Unit. Um, he's recently, or the Economist, recent, uh, you know, Adam led a research for a, a, you know, report called Do Innovation. Is that is that it, Adam? Uh, Destination Innovation is the Destination. is the website. It's part of Economist.com, and uh, Innovation is the topic of the first quarter uh, it's a year-long program of research yeah and the topic of this this particular report is the you know, innovation clusters in Dubai so we are going to discuss that today with with Adam um, so Adam just you know just give us some background on yourself uh, what led you to uh, do this research so we've been uh, very interested in understanding how innovation clusters work in different contexts around the world. Um, and the conversation uh, started really because we wanted to get away from the Silicon Valley kind of discourse, which is what everyone thinks about when they talk about innovation clusters. And we wanted to try and look at examples beyond Silicon Valley, um, in, in part because we think that for most countries, they're not going to be able to create or recreate the exact conditions that, that made Silicon Valley what it is. So it's much more useful to look um, further afield and try to find some kind of common principles uh, that account for the successful emergence and more importantly, the sustainability of innovation clusters over time. What makes them, uh, what makes them stay creative for long periods. And we, we wanted to talk about clusters in a holistic way. So not just about the companies, but the actual environment that they operate in, because that that's almost like an organism in, in itself uh, that changes over time and that shapes what companies do. So that was the, I suppose, the intellectual background for, for the project. Um, and we've been commissioned to do this research by Dubai Tourism. Dubai has ambitions to develop its own uh, innovation credentials. And there was an interest to understand more about uh, what what can we learn from case studies around the world? Okay, and what is what are those traits that you identified? Um, you know, is it, is it is something that's across the board, or is it just that specific to Dubai and you know, to them to their culture? So I think uh, that the research in the first quarter we basically looked at uh, several different clusters around the world, not not Dubai actually. Um, London Silicon Roundabout was one. Uh, Singapore. Estonia, Boulder in the US, um, and Bangalore. So we picked a real range of different country contexts, developing uh, economies and advanced economies, um, different kinds of sectors as well. And I mean, I think there are six broad uh, factors which we think all of these clusters, in order to be successful, tend to have. Um, in different combinations. One is obviously the cost structure. So if you want startups, they need to be able to afford to be uh, located there. And one of the challenges we see with clusters over time is when they become successful, they start to squeeze out the very startups that made them successful because the rents go up and the costs go up because everyone wants to be there. Um, policy is, a, is an important factor, especially migration policy. We think uh, your ability to access talent globally is really important. So in London, for instance, where we've seen a slight tightening of migration policy over the last couple of years, that's had a knock-on effect on how innovative uh, the, you know, London has been able to be. Um, livability, which is just like quality of life for, for people. People don't just want to work. They, if you want to attract brilliant people, they also want to have um, culture and uh, they want to have stuff to do and they want to have schools for their kids and so on. Um, obviously, a skilled workforce is essential. And so some relationship with the university system, some close proximity seems to be very important. General levels of, of infrastructure um, is unsurprisingly uh, crucial, especially um, you know uh, when you're looking at emerging markets. We looked at Bangalore, for instance, where the infrastructure is kind of starting to creak with traffic congestion and so on. That can become a real problem. Um, and then there's also an element of luck and serendipity, certain things that you can't necessarily design. Uh, it might be uh, some kind of historical trait that just meant that uh, you had a certain number of um, firms who happened to be co-located in an area and that became a cluster. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that that luck and serendipity happens. So those are the six kind of factors that we found common to all of the clusters. But of course, there are other places that also have those six and don't develop any successful innovation clusters. Mm -hmm. So there, that seems to be a necessary condition, but not a sufficient one. Uh, there also seems to be some 
extra element uh, that can't be fully kind of designed. And it may be a cultural factor as well. And culture is something that we are really interested in when we look at innovation. Yeah, it's, it's similar to, uh, you know, culture within organizations. <laughs> uh, they, they uh, you know, they create conditions, but, you know, sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, and, I mean, have, do you guys have any, any idea, you know, in your research as to what those, you know, missing factors are and how to push them so it does happen? So I think from a cultural perspective, there's two things that stand out. The first is... Um, is a positive approach to risk taking uh, within re within reason. Uh, I think there are some countries where taking risks and failing are not uh, taboo and they're not seen as um, uh, as failures as such. And the U.S. is obviously a great example of that. Uh, it's it's part of the DNA, I think, of the U.S. as a country. But there are many countries where that isn't true. There are many places around the world where if you have a failed business or you go bankrupt, you can go to jail. Not necessarily for having done any kind of fraud just for having failed at a business venture. So it's a huge deterrent to anybody who's going to try to, to take a risk. And, and if you look at a, an Elon Musk or someone like that and, you know, uh, how close he came to kind of ruination, I just think if you had prison as a potential outcome of that, you know, then, then clearly you're, you're going to be a more risk-averse person. So I think um, a more forgiving approach to kind of failures of business um, and also, uh, you know, a culture that doesn't look down on people who have failed and, and if anything, maybe respects them for having tried. The second thing is um, openness and general diversity, cultural diversity, a willingness to have people from different cultures and backgrounds. We see that the best, you know, the most prolific companies and the most innovative companies do seem to have that kind of inclusive culture um, that can be racial, it can be uh, it can be nationality, it can be ages and skill sets, it can be, um, you know, sexuality, like there are all kinds of ways that you can measure it. But it's hard to see um, anywhere pr progressing far if it doesn't have that kind of inclusive uh, and inclusive culture. Yeah, you know, in my, my experience down here in Mexico is that, in you know, particularly here across the board in Tijuana, when they started, uh, the government started pushing for, you know, trying to create a innovation cluster, um, I was actually part of one of the, for the beginnings of that. And one of the <clears throat> kind, of, kind of like how I laid it out for them was, you know, if you look at something for the future, what does this look like? And I said, I'd like to see myself, you know, having tacos, which are very popular in Mexico, you know, eating tacos with uh, somebody from Holland, somebody from China, you know, and it becomes normal. <laughs> it's not yeah. seen as, they're not seen as tourists, but they're seen as, you know, part of the, part of the, you know, natural view of every day and mm. I was particularly talking about you know be, being more diverse and you know sharing conditions for, for those people to come down here and uh, want to do stuff here as opposed to you know going somewhere else and whatnot but uh, yeah mm. it speaks to it, it speaks directly to diversity it's very hard to do um, I know I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the professor Sandy Petland no I'm not from from, from MIT he wrote a book called Social Physics, and he came up with uh, a pretty good explanation, and even with uh, you know research and whatnot, and graphs and whatnot. That basically he says the, the critical ingredients for any you know to create innovation in any type of uh, you know any type of place is uh, engagement exploration. So he's he's talking specifically about how to create what you were saying you know interactions between people who don't know each other, <laughs> and then having those conversations. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's uh, it's partly about people who have different skill sets. So the way they think about problems is very kind of different. And I think that's that's interesting because when you have a homogenous group of people, they tend to all kind of think in the same way. Um, and you often get people who uh, are, are able to get that combination of you, you need people with kind of technical skills in your field, but you also need people who are interested in stuff that's kind of quite remote from what you're doing and i think apple is a good example of that the interesting calligraphy and design things that i just yeah. don't think were kind of generally thought of as that relevant to computing but they drew kind of quite far and wide in terms of their the sources of their inspiration and when you read the biographies of particular people particular um, high achieving people they do have this incredible thirst for knowledge and they just kind of inhale books and it's not just about the stuff that they are doing in their day-to-day -day sense they have this kind of voracious appetite to learn about new topics and new fields um, so it's a it's a mark of a good company but it's also a mark of a good uh, of individual people who are innovators yeah 
Now, what if if a you know if a city were to uh, want to begin you know thinking about an innovation cluster, what would be you know what 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 is the component they would they would start off with if no, none of the other you know were present? It's a good question, um, and I think it's it's clearly the case that there are only certain things that can really be engineered, uh, and there are certain things that have to be left to the market and and left to to individuals. We've seen cases where governments have tried to build clusters and nobody has gone there and nobody has wanted to be part of it and there were various reasons for that um, so i think the government has to focus on what is it that the private sector can't do let's do that and let's leave everything else to free agents because free agents are just better at figuring stuff out and solving their own problems so when you look at that then obviously your public infrastructure um, your uh, public safety um, the kind of uh, the uh, the livability of a place in terms of everything functioning, people having Wi-Fi, the water system working, things being affordable in terms of public utilities, and on the policy front, as I say, like um, uh, it's important to have an open uh, migration policy. De dealing with the various kinds of political constraints on that, obviously, no no country has open borders, but you know. Taking a liberal approach to migration is something that governments and and city authorities could definitely do, um, and then investing in the education system as well and the university system to the extent that it's possible. Um, now, all of these things cost money, and if you're a developing country, then there are a lot of other things that you need to spend money on as well. So you have to make some pretty tough choices on which of those things you want to do and how much you want to spend. Um, but you do kind of feel like if you put that in place. Um, then you don't need to be specifying kind of what people should be doing in that space or what kind of research they should be undertaking. You're giving them the platform. Uh, and what we see when we look at any city uh, around the world is there's a huge amount of, of um, creativity that just comes from people being uh, liberated to be able to pursue the things that they want to do. Uh, and you should really use that energy uh, and, and let people do that, that bit of the work. Um, and you just give them the foundation to, to, to stand on. Okay. Now you mentioned that there are various reasons why, when, when some governments have you know, put these pieces in place, but nothing happened. Uh, what are those reasons? Well, I think one is um, is location. So I think there are some examples of smart cities and clusters attempts in a few countries where um, the location was just kind of too far from the interesting parts of the city. So people just didn't feel like you know they really wanted to live around there. It was bit of a kind of industrial estate so you obviously have this trade-off of you want a cheap rent and you want cheap kind of costs but then obviously as you get closer to the city whatever city you're talking about that gets harder because you're there's more demand for for, for that space so that's a pretty difficult thing to, to kind of figure out but I'd certainly would discourage anyone from trying to build something in the middle of nowhere um, <laughs> people aren't going to want to live there so you have to think about like where's our you know, if we look at our city at the moment, where are the most desirable parts of that city and how close can we get to that if we're going to create some new kind of zone or some new area? Because the people that we want to hire are going to want to be somewhere cool and, you know, somewhere that they can hang out with other people and, and just have a broader kind of set of interests than, than just their work. So that's definitely one thing that, um, that, that we've seen uh, go wrong in some places. Mm -hmm. And I, I would think that you know, because we always talk about, you know, the hot spots or hot cities being like, uh, you know, L.A., uh, Los Angeles, London, uh, Amsterdam, you know, Mexico City, uh, obviously Silicon Valley, San Francisco, New York, as being like hot spots because they have all these diverse people. It's easier to, you know, these things kind of just come together without intervention. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm down here, we've, you know, the, nothing, nothing of what you mentioned we've actually done, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is, which is, you know, kind of how it goes because, we, like you were saying, you know, you know, cities try to copy Silicon Valley. That's the wrong way to look at it. Um, whereas, you know, when I was, you know, trying to push this forward, I was saying, you know, let's 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 leave some people to do whatever the hell they want, but uh, you as the government try to push, you know, something, some components of this, but not trying to copy Silicon Valley because we don't have that. <laughs> We're not that. <laughs> and also, and also, in a way, you you um, you need to 
forge your own kind of identity you know as a as a cluster you need to find a way to do it yourself <clears throat> and you know we looked in in this project we looked at estonia and some of the th amazing technologies that have come out of estonia you know not a wealthy country uh, and a country that's actually had a lot of difficulties and is in quite a tricky kind of part of the world um vis-a-vis -vis russia and so on um Bangalore as well, you know, obviously has some amazing history in terms of the education system and so on, but it's still um, not a Los Angeles or a London, you know, there's a lot of like just difficulties of like running businesses there. So, uh, and each of these places has their own kind of character, you know, and their own stamp. So it's good to learn from other regions and, and to try not to kind of reinvent the wheel, but it's also important not to be derivative and try to just copy and paste something because it, it just won't work, you know. So you have to think about, you know, where where are, where's the skills clusters in our country? What are people kind of already doing and how can we help them to do that and make it easier for them? Mm -hmm. Now, it's funny because I was going to ask you about Estonia. Um, what, what particular is particularly, you know, about them, about Estonia, because, you, you know, a few years ago, they were not on the map. <laughs> uh, I mean, they were on the map, but you never consider, you know, a, you know, innovation coming from Estonia, uh, much less a hotspot now, because you, I mean, in, in my circles, I, I listen to that a lot. <laughs> Mm. I think Estonia is, a, is an interesting case study um, and I think there are a few things that, that are relevant. The first is that the country actually had quite a strong history in maths and engineering education which went back to the Soviet era. So, you know, in the Soviet era the, the quality of, um, of mathematics and education and um, engineering education, you know, competing neck and neck with the US for many years. So there was quite a strong education system which, which obviously uh, leaves a long kind of legacy. Um, there's also been a general uh, um, momentum from government to kind of use digital services in a lot of the public services that it offers. So it's quite a digitally kind of savvy government. And I think that's just normalized digital as a uh, as a sphere in which people kind of spend their time and, and do their activities. So it's a very kind of digitally uh, savvy, digitally literate kind of population. Um, and then you have some, I suppose, we might call them luck or serendipity factors. So uh, cybercrime was a big issue in Estonia mm. because of the high ICT penetration. Um, and that led entrepreneurs to think about different kinds of telecommunications technologies and Skype came out of that. So I think it's also an example of a place that used adversity to drive innovation, which is again something that you think, you know, people look at it and say, maybe you need to be a rich country to develop clusters, but you, you need challenges to innovate. That's what most interesting mm -hmm. innovation really is about solving yeah. problems. So yeah. uh, those are the things that really stood out in the in the case of Estonia. Um, now, one other thing I'd mention is this, um, uh, the education spending. I mean, we have some data in the in the report which looks at um, you know government commitment to kind of public education, and I think that's also definitely a big factor. Okay. Now you mentioned rich countries. Um, this this was uh, this report was commissioned by Dubai Tourism, and you guys also look at Dubai as a as a cluster. Dubai has a lot of money to spend. What is what is different about Dubai? <laughs> Well, I think that the project actually didn't look at Dubai. I mean, when, when we do these projects, we tend to focus on kind of global evidence. And, and we okay. the idea was really, you know, Dubai has ambitions to develop its own innovation credentials. And it also wants to speak to innovators in other parts of the world and kind of understand how, uh, you know, what the best practices are. So the case studies that we picked in this project actually weren't focused on, on Dubai. The idea was more to pick out case studies that we thought were diverse enough that they would provide us with kind of some relevant lessons and principles from other countries. Okay. Um, partly that that may help to inform innovation in Dubai, which is clearly happening. And we've, we've done quite a lot of other research projects that look at um, uh, digital entrepreneurship, especially, which is, which is quite active. Um, in terms of money and investment, I mean, you know, you're right that obviously there are countries that have more resources to invest in the infrastructure and in connectivity and Wi-Fi and so on. And that is definitely a big help. Um, uh, but I suppose one of the interesting things from looking at Estonia and Bangalore was that actually it's also about the energy and the creativity of the population. Um, and it's not just about money. So if you can have that investment and you can have the right you know communities in your in your country then that's a really powerful combination yeah you know that reminds me of 
uh, you know, Chile in Latin America, more than, I think it was like seven, six, seven years ago, they created this program called Startup Chile, where they basically, create, you know, they basically paid people to come <laughs> to Chile. Um, and, it, and, you know, pretty much the whole world is now down in Chile, you know, trying to, you know, build stuff. I, at the moment, I thought that was brilliant. Um, and I actually pitched it over here in Mexico. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, like the, the resource, how to use resource, how to use the money. Um, you know, we don't know because, you know, that's kind of like internal to Chile. But I thought that was a brilliant move just because that's what you were saying. You know, how do you, you know, create, you know, bring in the talent to down here and then mix it up with your people. And that creates, you know, part of the ecosystem. Now, in terms yeah, of... Yeah. You know, Singapore as well, uh, not, you know, not necessarily through kind of like directly paying people, but obviously, you know, they have attracted a lot of very skilled people, mainly to come and work in kind of big, big companies. But the salaries have obviously been a factor there in order to attract, you know, people who could who could go elsewhere. Um, so it's definitely relevant. Awesome. Now, in terms of evidence, what what evidence suggests to a government, to a city that, you know, there's you know, the, the cluster is, you know, having its fruit, it's bearing fruits. So I think you obviously, um, you need to look at kind of value add, value addition basically that's happening in the cluster. So what is it that's being created by the companies that are there? And you can measure that in a lot of ways. You can measure that by just like the commercial success of companies. You can measure it by patents, but patents obviously don't necessarily tell you all that much about innovation. Um, you can measure it by demand, like how many people are actively kind of, uh, you know, trying to get in and trying to be part of it. How much are you trying to get people to come? If you set up a cluster and after five years you're still doing roadshows, you know, and trying to pitch it to people, then, you know, something's kind of not right. So I think you need to think about it both in terms of the commercial success of the companies, the degree of sort of um, intellectual property formation, IP formation, mm -hmm. and you know, demand to be there. Um, but at the same time, I think if you, you know, it's quite hard to have a, a single metric to work out, you know, how innovative a cluster is. Because you, you could have a company that's making a lot of money uh, through kind of cloning existing technologies and, and finding other ways of um, uh, repackaging things that already exist. There are companies like Rocket Internet that have done very well doing that. But it, you wouldn't necessarily call it innovation. So there's a question there to ask about, are we interested in just the creation of, economic value or are we also interested in, in innovation and what's the balance between the two um, I think it's quite hard for governments to know what the answer is to that because at any one time they're also dealing with the public schooling system and healthcare and all of these other areas so you know it may be advisable to have some kind of um, dedicated agency or body that can help to advise the government on what it needs to do what should it get involved in what should it stay out of um, and you know how sustainable is its investment if it's spending money and so on, uh, and an agency that has a little bit of independence from the government so that they can just tell the government in an open way it's not working or you know this needs to change because mm -hmm. one of the problems with any big initiative to create some new smart city or a cluster or whatever is um, it's quite embarrassing for people to admit that it's failed if it has. And so it can be difficult for governments to kind of admit that. Um, there should be no shame in it, just like there should be no shame in companies failing. But when you spend public money on anything and it doesn't work, I think the approach is less forgiving than if you're a company and you've spent your own money on something and it hasn't worked. So mm -hmm. having some kind of advisory agency or body can help you in that um, because it gives you an independent source of advice that has your interests at heart, you know. And, and and if uh, if a government built that that governing body, advisory body, who should be on there? <laughs> well, ideally, you'd, you'd have people who are kind of representatives of the the the, the key uh, kind of stakeholders. So you would want someone from the entrepreneurship community in your country, someone who has had success and who knows what they're talking about, has <clears throat> created and run and, and maybe sold, you know, maybe several businesses. So you want to kind of reach out to your top, your top brass, and it doesn't. It's not a full time kind of position. It can just be some kind of advisory role. And I think people would be very receptive to playing that kind of a, a role in helping their country to to, to prosper. Um, of course, you would need someone who has some public policy experience to understand that you know 
companies are always asking for money from government for everything. So you do have to have some filter on that and someone to say, actually, you know what, you guys should be doing, spending money on this, or we can't give you a tax break for every single thing that you want to do. Um, so I think, you know, people who have that kind of experience, maybe in academia, who have the public policy knowledge, who understand the full spectrum of things that governments have to think about when they're allocating resources. Um, and they can kind of, they can be a check on each other, those two communities. Um, and then the government can also sit on that on that sort of panel. Um, and I think that's a good kind of cross section of um, of interests and 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 stakeholders. Okay. Now that um, there's something you mentioned previously that I was gonna ask you, but it went to uh, <laughs> some words on my head. Um, now what you know in terms of improving or the effectiveness of a cluster, um, is a is a you know how do you how does it, you determine that I mean how do you do it if is that you let it go you know via you know like the, the free agents as you call them <laughs> or you, is it you as a government you know push that push that agenda more I think it's hard to see any cluster working in the long term if it requires constant priming <clears throat> and promotion by government um, I just don't I just don't I think if it if it gets to a point like I said where you're you feel like you're having to pitch for this thing and you're having to try to convince people to come and locate there, you know, and it doesn't happen, then you need to kind of step away. I don't think there's many examples of clusters where the government has kind of driven it, but the government can be a client, you know, and we've seen that in, in Silicon Valley, you know, there are big companies that have come about and have been helped by contracts with government. Um, you know, that's, that's true of a lot of the biggest technologies that have come about in history. They've, they've had some kind of government contract. Um, so I think that's maybe a role that the kind of procurement side, um, but I don't think, you know, the whole, the DNA of kind of innovation clusters is really about free agents, um, you know, coming together and finding new ways to solve their problems. And I don't think that's compatible with the heavy hand of the state um, because there are limits on what the state can kind of do and how, and frankly, how smart any government is able to be. It can't compete with the knowledge that's embedded in all of those many different people. Um, you know, so it's about knowing what, what you should do and what, what to leave to other people. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, beyond, I, you talked about Estonia, you talked about uh, a little bit of Singapore, what, you know, of the other uh, clusters that you studied, which ones, you know, also stick out for particular reasons? So Bangalore was, was interesting um, because, mainly because one of the things we wanted to look at in all of this research was how, how clusters change over time. Uh, and how the success of a cluster can kind of create new challenges that it has to solve to, to kind of stay ahead. Um, and we found Bangalore interesting because it kind of benefited from several, uh, you know, over the, over the last few decades, it benefited from several kind of um, starting conditions. One was uh, obviously it has this fantastic education system, like the Indian higher education system is amazing. Uh, so there was a huge amount of kind of, 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 of skills there. Um, the Indian government had been quite proactive in kind of promoting, you know, software and technology, and it saw that this was an area that they wanted to develop and had technology parks that were set up, um, you know, to, to help solve that, um, uh, well, to help companies to kind of uh, enter into the market. And then you also had some, some good fortune. So, like, it, it being an English-language-speaking country obviously meant that it was able to develop this relationship with the U.S. and Europe in terms of business process outsourcing. And the time zone was also very fortunate because... Indian firms were able to take on uh, business process tasks at the end of the, and, and have stuff ready for the US kind of when the US came in. So there was a time zone aspect, which, which was also helpful. Um, at the same time, as time has gone by, uh, there have been some challenges to the model. So one of them is, is uh, you know, this intense kind of price competition because there are now so many companies offering these kinds of outsourcing services. And when you have that very uh, cutthroat competition, reinvestment tends to go down and, and innovation tends to go down and, and you tend to be competing on price and you shouldn't really compete on price. You should compete on, on product and on quality and innovation. Whenever you compete on price, it becomes kind of a problem, the congestion problem that's serious just because of the crowding and so on and then you also have uh, policy issues like IP policy so I think the IP policy in India has been somewhat loose 
and that led a lot of US firms to be reluctant to outsource much of their R&D. So they were outsourcing quite low value tasks uh, and it was quite hard for companies to really climb the value chain. It would have been good for more R&D work to be outsourced um, or to be shared between a US company and a subsidiary. But the IP policy in India was seen to be quite loose. Um, uh, and so there wasn't that much of that kind of high value uh, R&D happening. IP is a really complicated topic, though. So it's not necessarily a criticism of the of the Indian kind of policy stance, because there are good reasons why you need to strike the right balance with with innovation and IP policy. Um, but we looked at it in the context of the report as just a factor that was influencing how Bangalore was kind of functioning as a cluster and what kinds of things people were doing and what the enablers and constraints on that were. Mm -hmm. um, no. I, think, I think looking at the others, I mean, uh, London was was uh, was really a, an interesting example because Silicon Roundabout really emerged in this pocket of London, East London, that was unusually cheap at the time because it was quite a poor part of London, uh, but it was very well connected to the city. Um, so in the early 2000s, a lot of these startups were able to form there, but that area became so hip because of them and also because of general kind of gentrification that it, it, it became this incredibly expensive place and then the developers moved in and then it became a lot harder to have kind of um, uh, basically to, to rent any space as a, as a startup. So I think London was interesting because we just saw the fact that it was the, partly the success of what was happening as well as some other broader things that were going on in the country that just made this place too expensive for other companies later to do the same thing and so they've had to go further out oh and yeah so that you touched upon a question i was going to ask you about you know whether at the beginning of a cluster those initial seeds are the downfall for the cluster later on <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, part, part of the dynamic that we found is that um, all of the challenges are, in a sense, the consequences of success. So they're, they're sort of like growing pains, I suppose, is, is how we best think of them. They're not random shocks. I mean, you can have random shocks, like a sudden policy decision on migration and so on, which has nothing to do with the cluster. But then you also do have these internal dynamics within a cluster that mean that becoming successful sows the seeds of a later problem. Whether that becomes your demise or whether you then find ways to reinvent yourself is, is down to kind of the, the people who make the decisions over, uh, over kind of what, what happens within, within the cluster. I think it's a bit like companies. I think companies go along the same curve. You know, they, they, they have to continually uh, deal with consequences of success, you know. Um, you know they create a great product and then suddenly they haven't got an inventory to they haven't got enough of the thing to sell it and then they need warehouses so this is what we wanted to get to get at really that clusters are kind of like companies you know they they evolve over time and they change and the ways that they change also shapes everything that happens in in that terrain you know yeah so it's like the, it's the strategy paradox <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> you you commit to to something and that eventually might become your demise if you don't you know Jump off that and create something else. Yeah. Um, now, how does a how does a you know is that to manage that you know like you're saying similar to an organization is that is that something that did you find something in in a cluster did you study where that actually happened where they started and shifted to something else? I think most of what we uh, most of what we looked at in this report was mainly about identifying what the curve was um, and and what effect that was having on companies. The problem is that there's no one who really makes decisions about what's going to happen to a cluster. You know, once it's up and once companies are there, it's kind of got a life of its own. Um, but obviously what tends to happen is that like in London, you will just get, you know, Google might come and buy office space in London. So you'll just get big companies coming in. So it doesn't necessarily kind of, it doesn't end. It just changes in terms of like who's there and what they're doing. It'd be quite hard to generalize across the board, like how, how different clusters evolved. Um, but we did we did point out a few things that you know that that can be done in order to kind of make uh, make the decision making process as kind of as easy as possible for companies to to decide whether or not they want to go there. But again, we we have to be honest about the fact that once a cluster exists, nobody is really managing it anymore. Um, so whether it survives will just depend on the individual decisions of lots and lots of disaggregated agents yeah. and if they all decide at some point that this isn't the best place for them anymore then that will be the end of it 
you know, it, it reminded me of a, a cause about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I did a, I was tasked with, you know, helping this city come up with a strategic plan for 2015. So my task was to not, not repeat the, 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 the same activities from the last year, but the way, the way, as you know, politics, how it works is that they said, no, let's repeat the same thing. <laughs> so when they evaluate it, yeah, because it was like saying, you know, what's our real identity? So we were, we're looking at what historically what we've been known for down here. We said, well, we, we have to shift from that because we already do that. <laughs> but that mm -hmm. doesn't take us to a new identity. And that's very hard. And, it, you know, the, the proposals were, were, you know, read, but they were not accepted. So they, they came back to doing the same stuff all over again. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's like, uh, it's very, very hard to, to make that shift. So, I mean, it really depends, as you were saying, it really depends on the, you know, the positions of a lot of actors, you know, free agents, you know, coming up to their own conclusions and then pushing that forward as opposed to the government setting the agenda and saying, this is how we're going to do it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and make it as easy as possible for people to uh, go about their day, you know. Yeah. Basically, that's all the government has to do, you know, make it as easy as possible for people to go about their day. People are pretty good at figuring stuff out and solving their problems. So you just have to kind of make that as easy as you can. And you don't really need to do a whole lot more than that. Um, kind of let people, you know, let people kind of uh, solve their problems and make sure that you as a government are not one of their problems. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a big one. <laughs> Everybody, everybody complains about the government. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, okay, well, and how do you, how do we, you know, find your report? That that's a, it's, a, it's free, right? It's not yeah, it's free. And uh, if you type destination innovation and economist.com, it's a microsite there, and uh, it's running for twelve months. <clears throat> we've got the whole first quarter of content, which has each of these case studies that we've discussed, um, and and some infographics as well. Um, but then over the course of the next year, we're going to be publishing more and more um, research. And in the second quarter, we're looking at geography and innovation. So we're looking at how geography and physical proximity affects innovation as well. So we're kind of really trying to delve really deeply into this topic. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be there for 12 months. And uh, it's, it should be pretty easy to find if you if you type that into into your browser, Google or whatever. Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll put that under the video here, and then on the blog post, I'll share the links and uh, share any you know, relevant information that you'd like me to share with my audience. And, uh, and you know, any any parting thoughts about the you know the work? Well, we, we're really keen to know what people think of our research, and so uh, you know, there's social media links on on the site, and we'd be we'd be keen on hearing kind of what people think about our take on this topic. Do, do they think that we've got the right conditions for success if we missed anything um, and we're really interested to hear people's kind of stories uh, from their own countries about how they see this innovation clusters uh, issue panning out um, because we really we really hungry for all of that kind of uh, testimony to try and see what are the kind of common pain points and what are the common themes so yeah we're, we're really keen to kind of hear from people um, throughout the program so yeah just connect with us on on social media and let us know what you think okay now if people want to connect with you because you were you were leading this research if they want to connect with you do you have are you on social media just uh, or just email yeah just email really but i can send you my email address and uh and and maybe we can post it on the blog um, yeah, people can contact me me directly. All of our social media is part of our research team, so we are all kind of involved with it. But if people want to contact me directly, I can I can send my email through, and uh, we can post it on the blog. Outstanding. Okay. Well, Adam, thank you so much for you know taking the time to uh, discuss your, your report with me, and uh, I will make sure that you at least hear from me in my city <laughs> yes, um, <for> sure. <laughs> to share share the, our you know particular experience. And I will, you know, let you know when I have the blog post up and uh, the recording of this video. Great. It's been really good to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Adam. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.